We're going to preach on Epiphany today. We've been in the season of Epiphany, and we begin each Epiphany season with the reading of the story of the baptism of uh, Jesus, which is an Epiphany story. And we conclude usually with this story about Jesus taking the disciples up to the Mount of Transfiguration. So we're going to read this. I'm going to read from the translation called The Message by Eugene Peterson. Every once in a while somebody will say, I don't have a Bible uh, or I want to get a new Bible and what do you suggest? The Bibles we have in the pews are New Revised Standard Version and we use them most of the time so I always suggest that if you just have one Bible you get that. If you want to get another Bible, another translation to get a new kind, sometimes you'll get a new insight or a new kind of feeling or tone about a passage. I think The Message by Eugene Peterson is really, really an interesting translation. So, um, and you can get in online these days, by the way. So, we're going to take a look at two texts here. They're both texts for Epiphany. We'll talk in a moment about the meaning of the season in the word, especially the word Epiphany. This is the story of the transfiguration from the Gospel of Matthew. Six days later, three of them saw that glory. Jesus took Peter and the brothers, James and John, and led them up a high mountain. His appearance changed from the inside out, right before their eyes. Sunlight poured from his face. His clothes were filled with light. Then they realized that Moses and Elijah were also there in deep conversation with him. You're getting the picture here on top of the mountain, really a phenomenal kind of transcending event. And Peter broke in saying, Master, this is a great moment. What would you think if I built three memorials here on the mountain, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah? In other words, this is such a great time. We're at peace. Let's just camp out here for the rest of our lives. While he was going on like this, babbling, as Peter sometimes did, a light radiant cloud enveloped them and sounding from deep in the cloud a voice saying, this is my son, marked by my love, focus of my delight, Listen to him. If you're used to reading this in the RSV, you can kind of see the difference in the language here, which I think is quite nice. When the disciples heard it, they fell flat on their faces, scared to death. But Jesus came over and touched them. Don't be afraid, he said. When they opened their eyes and looked around, all they saw was Jesus, only Jesus. And coming down the mountain, Jesus swore them to secrecy. Don't breathe a word of what you've seen until after the Son of Man is raised from the dead and then you are free to talk. Now we're going to read from the gospel from the letter of 2 Peter which is of course a post-resurrection scripture where they do in fact talk about this event. We weren't you know just wishing and the, and, and the writer here is speaking on behalf of the disciples, the apostles. We weren't you know just wishing on a star when we laid the facts out before you regarding the powerful return of our master Jesus Christ. We were there for the preview. So, no, that's, a, that's a Eugene Peterson kind of statement. We were there for the preview, kind of a foretaste of the resurrection. We saw it with our own eyes, Jesus resplendent with light from God the Father as the voice of majestic glory spoke, saying, this is my son marked by my love, focus of all my delight. We were there on the holy mountain with him. We heard the voice out of heaven with our very own ears. We couldn't be more sure of what we saw and heard, God's glory, God's voice. The prophetic word was confirmed to us. You'll do well to keep focusing on it. It is the one light you have in a dark time as you wait for daybreak and the rising of the morning star in your hearts. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, epiphany, it is one of the best words in the dictionary. I love this word, epiphany, and yet it's not an everyday word in the vocabulary of most of us, is it? So I've done you a little favor here. I went to Merriam-Webster online, and you can find several definitions of this word epiphany, but we're going to look at a couple of them. This first one, of course, is the Christian festival that begins on January the 6th. Every year, January the 6th, 12 years after Christmas, 12 days after Christmas, the 12 days of uh, Christmas, right? Uh, Then it begins on January 6th in honor of the coming of the three kings to the infant Jesus. 
So that was the epiphany or the unveiling of uh, God's truth to the Gentile nation. But here's the definition I want us to, it's the more generic definition I want to focus on today. A moment in which you suddenly see or understand something in a new or very clear way. Now that's why I like that word. It's a really powerful word. And I don't know that there's any other word, uh, an appropriate synonym for this word epiphany. It's a moment when the light, the season of epiphany is often associated with light. A moment when the light comes on. It's as if some great truth uh, or um, some manifestation of a great truth is, has been in the dark and all of a sudden the light comes on and you see it and you see it clearly. It's oftentimes a life-changing experience. And it is an experience that you've had, by the way, at one time or another, when you stop and think about it. Maybe it was a moment like the disciples had. You were in Colorado someplace and you climbed to the top of a mountain. And on top of the mountain you saw such beauty you'd never experienced before and you, you knew something that you did not know before about the power and the majesty and the glory of God's creation. For me, it was the Grand Canyon. I remember as a child going to the Grand Canyon. A, a friend of mine down the street had been to the Grand Canyon, and he said, well, it's not a big deal. It's just kind of a big hole in the ground. Uh-uh. I don't know what he was looking at. But I remember standing before the Grand Canyon and just literally being in awe at the majesty, the power, the glory of God's creation. It was one of those moments when the light came on and, and I understood something about God that I had not understood before, especially about this God that we refer to as a creator God or in the Trinity we say God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God the Father, the God who created earth. And when you look at something like the Grand Canyon, then that word beauty takes on new meaning. And I have to tell you that I've never read Genesis 1 since then in exactly the same light. You think about reading Genesis 1 in the light of the beauty that you saw from that mountain up in Colorado or Utah or, or the Grand Canyon, and all of a sudden it takes on new and powerful meaning, doesn't it? And it doesn't make any difference. Scientists can tell us that, that creation began... Uh, trillions of years ago with a, a little atom of some kind, something smaller than an atom and a big bang and all of that has happened. It doesn't make any difference if that's exactly the way it happened or not. What we know is that somehow there was a creative God, a creative God creating beauty and symmetry beyond our understanding. Epiphany, that moment when the light suddenly comes on. You've probably had an epiphany, most of you, in one way or the other about this word that is so overused and yet a word that we can never discard, the word love. Love. I was thinking about this this past week. For some reason, I got to thinking about my fourth grade teacher. I had a crush on my fourth grade teacher. Lakewood Elementary School. I, I, I thought that I was in love with my fourth grade teacher and I'd heard a lot of songs about love and I'd read some poetry. I thought it was love. And then I remember growing older and having my first crush as an adolescent. Then a little bit older and I was in high school and I dated a girl and I thought maybe I'm in love with her. And then college, you know this story, don't you? You have these experiences and and you think you know and understand about love and you've read some novels about love and you listen to music all the time on the radio about love. And then you look at that baby just born. You gaze down onto that baby just born and the light comes on and you say, ah, this is love. And creation too, right? This is the ideal. When the Bible talks about love, it's this kind of incredible, unmitigated, liberating love. 
So those epiphany moments are extraordinarily important to us. They're the ones that propel us through life with a sense of clarity about who we are and who created us and our mission in life. And so we get to this particular moment in the Gospel of Matthew, the 17th chapter, and Jesus takes these three disciples up there. I don't know why he didn't take all of the disciples, but we know that he had this kind of inner circle. And they were, I guess, to be kind of the carriers of the special good news, more understanding perhaps, or insight. So he takes Peter Peter and the two brothers, James and John, and he intends for this to be an epiphany moment. Not only are they at the top of this mountain, but this cloud descends and all of a sudden they hear the words, this is my son with whom I am pleased. And Probably the disciples don't really understand fully what is happening here, but nevertheless, the light comes on and they understand something about Jesus they did not understand before. You read through the Gospels and you can see that the disciples are in the dark a lot of the time, especially in the Gospel of Mark. It's like they live in the dark. They don't really understand what's going on. They don't understand what Jesus is telling them. They don't understand what the mission is about. You read all of, the, all of the Gospels, and when they get to Jerusalem, it's clear that they really do not understand what the mission is all about, what Jesus is about to do. But this was a pivotal moment for them when the light comes on, and they say, yes, this man is the Messiah. And they want to stay there, but as you can almost predict if you know anything about Uh, the gospel story of Jesus. They start coming down the mountain. Jesus says, you can't stay up here. And on the way down the mountain, Jesus swears them to secrecy. He says, tell no one about this whatsoever until I have come again, till I have been resurrected, till after the Son of Man comes again. And so this is an epiphany secret that they carry with them. They carry with them through the darkness of what's about to come. And we know what comes next. Because as Jesus and the disciples come down the mountain, Jesus is headed straight for Jerusalem. He talks about in this, it talks about in the scripture, the darkness. He is headed straight for Jerusalem in the dark days that are ahead. The passion Holy Week, the crucifixion. And during all of this time, these disciples carry these words with them unrevealed to the others. And though they couldn't completely understand what was happening in these dark days, isn't it clear that these words and this experience somehow sustained them, at least gave them a slender thread of hope as they lived through the darkness of that week in Jerusalem. And now, you and I, on the edge of Lent, Wednesday night we'll gather here, we'll impose ashes, an archaic and yet what a remarkably meaningful symbolic service this is and we will enter into the dark days of Lent for some of us that may be primarily a symbolic journey because it may be that everything in your life is just going wonderfully no challenges whatsoever the kids are doing well no health issues to challenge you business is good But for others, this symbolic journey through the darkness has existential power, doesn't it? Because you're living through it. There are tough challenges in your life. And sometimes the world feels darker than we want it to. And what Jesus is saying to us, I think, is that we are sustained and vitalized through the darkness, whether it be the symbolic darkness of Lent or through the very real darkness that we are experiencing in life during Lent or beyond. We are sustained by our memories, by our epiphany moments. In a few moments, we're going to celebrate the meal. And Jesus says, remember 
remember this. Jesus expected us, as he expected the disciples, to be sustained by our memories when dark times come. Those epiphanies when we said, ah, oh, yes, that's what creation is about. Yes, that is what beauty is about. Yes, that is the meaning of love. Yes, that is the power of Christ in our lives. Sustained by our memories of those epiphany moments. Let's go back here and look at our text, the 19th chapter of Peter, and we will end with these words. When times get dark and life gets tough, we would do well to remember this 19th verse. We couldn't be more sure of what we saw and heard. God's glory, God's voice. The prophetic word was confirmed to us and in us. You'll do well to keep focusing on it. It's the one light you have in a dark time as you wait for daybreak. And the rising of the morning star in your hearts. Amen.